commentary on each book of the Bible. So that you don't just get one, if you get an annotated Bible, you get one scholar's footnotes, right? You notice this. It's one scholar. It's the, whoever Oxford paid to write the commentary on Genesis, you see? Whoever Abingdon paid to write the commentary on Exodus. But the Torah, the woman's commentary, has maybe four, maybe five voices, five different women's voices on each book of the Hebrew Bible. That is a treasure. That is a treasure beyond pearls and rubies. So I recommend that to you. And I recommend that if you, if you, if you grab your book budget for the year, get your church library to buy it, so that not just you benefit from it, but everybody else has access to it in your church. Great. There's also a commentary that you might be interested in, the Women's Bible Commentary. Now, it's true that if you go into your local bookshop, you can find commentaries by any group under the sun on the biblical text, right? Have you noticed this? It's, it's quite wonderful. There's a thing called the Global Bible Commentary. There's a thing called the Africana Bible Commentary. Do you see? There are commentaries on the Bible published by publishers from lots of different perspectives. Okay? So I'm just going to mention the Women's Bible Commentary. The reason I'm mentioning that is that I'm just finishing the revision of the revised Women's Bible Commentary, and I have a little article in it on non women in non-canonical texts. So in other words, if you just wait a few months, there'll be, <laughs> <laughs> there'll be a revised Women's Bible Commentary, and that was edited by Newsom, Carol Newsom, and Ring, R-I-N-G-E, Sharon Ring. Okay? So I'm now telling you about a resource written by Jewish women scholars, the Torah, the Women's Commentary, and I'm telling you about resources written by Christian scholars, women's, the Women's Bible Commentary. Okay? So those are, those are two resources to look for if you don't already have them when you, when you, when you come to try to remember what was it that we, that we talked about here, Genesis 1, 26 and 7. So back... Back then to the text. So then let's, let's leave the text as it is. When God is speaking, God is saying, let us make, and God is making humanity. And humanity made in God's image is, verse 27, male and female. I'm just going to pause for two seconds and say what is in the text and what isn't in the text. Because those are very important principles by which I operate exegetically. Exegetically means to try and bring out meanings into the from the text. All of us bring meanings into the text. We can't avoid that because we have our own perspectives on, on, on life and we bring those into the text. But, but we, all we need to do is be honest about them. Let me, let me just say two things then. You see this verb make. When God in verse 26 says, Genesis 1, 26, let us make. It's only God who makes. In Genesis only God makes. Nobody else makes. The verb to make is a verb of creativity in Hebrew. Do you see? So you can't say this is an insignificant verb and anybody can make anything under the sun. Because that's how we use the verb make. You know? Fred, go make me a painting. Do you see? But in Genesis, at this point, in this verse, it's just the verb that describes the creative act of God. To make. To create. Bara in Hebrew. Okay? Now I'm going to observe what isn't in the text. And I'm going to look at this language for male and female in verse 27. What doesn't it say? It does say male and female, but it doesn't say man and woman. Now, you might extrapolate man and woman from male and female, but the text doesn't compel you to do that. You might say, well, what's the difference between male and female and man and woman? There is a difference, or we wouldn't have this language, right? Um, you could say, for example, that um, you could say that things in languages have a male or a female or a neuter gender. Do you see? If you speak another language besides English, you'll know what I'm speaking about. Now that gender doesn't have much, the gender of a table, doesn't have much to do with sexuality, right? But you can see the function of male and female in language when you apply that term, male and female, to the structure. But men and women, men and women are 
you know, looking around us, there are men and women here, do you see? So men and women are clearly identified, but the text is not talking about them. The text is talking about male and female, and that must be a deliberate choice. And how to interpret that choice is a focus of interpreting Genesis 1, 26 and 7. Okay? Anybody want to ask a question about Genesis 1:26?